harm. It's a phrase often associated with the practice of medicine and evokes expectations of health and well-being. Every day across the country, people come to hospitals. They come for help, for answers, and because they don't know what else to do. While in the hospital, they expect that the ethical principles of non-maleficence to do no harm, beneficence to do good, and autonomy to be able to make their own health care decisions will be honored. These probably aren't the words they use, but this is what people expect. When somebody first enters the hospital, there's a great deal of information that needs to be gathered. In addition to the questions one might typically expect, code status is an important piece of information. This tells the hospital what the patient wants done in the event their heart would stop during their hospitalization. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, or do not resuscitate, DNR, that is the question. Pretty heady stuff to be discussing when somebody has just arrived in the hospital and is probably anxious. The timing and quality of this discussion varies depending on the knowledge, skill, and comfort level of the person charged with obtaining that information. A few years ago, I accompanied my mom to the hospital after she'd been seen in the emergency department. As she was getting settled, a nurse came in to begin collecting the needed information. When she got to the topic of code status, she said to my frail 86-year-old mom, who was about this tall by that time, you do want us to heart, start your heart back up if it stops while you're here, don't you? I truly believe that this nurse expected the answer to that question was going to be a resounding, well, yes. The reasons for this are many, but the one that has my attention is the fact that in the hospital, the default rule is if your heart stops, CPR is performed. It's the expected action, and because it is, there is little sense of urgency to clarify code status, and the discussions regarding CPR are often superficial. Not included in the question asked my mom was, what exactly does it take to get your heart started again? What can happen during the course of resuscitation? How successful is CPR? Mom was lucky. She had my 29 years of experience providing hospice care and working in hospital ethics committees at her side to be sure those questions got answered. Most people don't have that kind of a resource. If you're a patient in the hospital and your heart stops, CPR will be performed without your written consent. It's a default rule. The only exception to this rule is if a physician has entered a do not resuscitate order and documented it in your medical record. In the absence of this order, CPR is performed. CPR provides an intersection of several important ethical principles. It has the potential to do great good. It also has the potential to do harm, which is why I'm suggesting that the default rule in the hospital be reversed, that resuscitation not occur until somebody has provided informed consent. Because sometimes CPR goes awry, it can cause an injury, sometimes irreparable. Consider this story published on May 14th of this year in the Daily News. A 90-year-old gentleman with Parkinson's disease was resuscitated without his consent when his heart stopped during surgery. The chest compressions cracked his sternum and he was unable to breathe on his own, so a, feeding tube, or a breathing tube was inserted. He was connected to a breathing machine and transferred to the hospital's intensive care unit. There, a feeding tube was inserted. While staying in ICU, his memory faded, his speech became slurred, but after 13 days, he was discharged to go home requiring the care of two family members. Six weeks later, in severe pain, he died. Let me be clear, I am not suggesting that this rule refer reversal occur in emergency departments when a patient presents in cardiac crisis. I am proposing that when somebody is admitted to the hospital, the process to determine their code status include informed consent. Informed consent is a process hospitals have in place to provide patients with the information they need so they can make their own medical decision. It honors patient autonomy. There are three basic steps. 
The first is that the provider and the patient have a discussion regarding the proposed procedure. It includes the benefits, the risks, and potential outcomes. Next, the patient makes a decision regarding that procedure that's in keeping with their own values. And last, the patient has to understand the implications of the decision they've made. This is all documented in the patient's medical record. When somebody is in the hospital, informed consent is one of the things that's available to them. And hospitals require this for a variety of procedures. This includes surgery, chemotherapy, anesthesia. It's a long list, but CPR is not on that list. Yet, CPR has the potential to cause broken bones, intolerable pain, dependence on technology for the remainder of someone's life. A procedure with the potential to cause these outcomes should require informed consent. A look at the history of CPR provides some insight as to how we've arrived at our current default rule. In the 18th century, resuscitation was considered impious and placed on the level of like raising the dead. Despite this dubious beginning, for the next 200 years, we continued to try to figure out how to bring people back to life. In 1956, mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation was invented. In 1969, CPR was developed, and the American Heart Association did physician education. In 1972, widespread community education was rolled out to teach the general public how to perform CPR. In 2018, CPR is expected to raise the dead. An idea fueled by television and movies. So, what is successful CPR? The definition of success is the return of spontaneous circulation, the resumption of breathing and pulse or a blood pressure. To achieve this, a person's chest must be compressed at least two inches. This requires a force of 100 to 125 pounds. Even when successful, CPR doesn't fix other health problems a person may have. So if somebody has dementia or cancer or diabetes or COPD, any number of health problems, these remain and are often exacerbated after CPR is performed. Yet, there is widespread belief among the general public that CPR is successful at least 75% of the time. But the numbers regarding the success rate of in-hospital CPR tell an entirely different story. The acute success rate, this is the number of attempts that result in the return of spontaneous circulation, is about 40%. But the number that has the greatest impact is the survival to discharge rate. These are individuals who survive the CPR episode and are able to be discharged from the hospital. This is between 10 and 11%. Research has shown the characteristics of individuals most likely to, sur to survive CPR. As you might expect, these are people who are younger. They are also people whose primary health problem is cardiac in nature and who were functionally independent prior to the CPR episode. Even when it is successful, there can be great personal costs associated with surviving CPR, such as brain damage, a decrease in the functional level, an inability to provide self-care requiring an alternative living setting. Given, these, if, given this information regarding the outcomes and success of CPR, I was really concerned when I received a call a couple years ago from the nursing home where my dad had lived for a few months. They reported that they found him passed out with an irregular heartbeat. So they called the ambulance to transport him to the emergency room, and then they called me. At the time, I was working a couple hours away. My dad's name was Cassius, kind of a big name for little kids to, to say. So his eight-year-old great-granddaughter dubbed him Grandpa Casserole. <laughs> Grandpa Casserole did not mirror the characteristics of somebody likely to survive CPR. He was almost 99 years old, very frail, and had dementia. It was a long drive to the emergency room. 
giving me time to wonder what was going to happen to my dad and to think about the ethical implications of the current default CPR rule in hospitals. There are five primary principles of medical ethics. These are to not cause harm, to do good, to use resources fairly and justly, to tell the truth, and to provide patients with information needed so they can make their own healthcare decisions. Our current default CPR rule in the hospital does not honor these ethical principles in the following ways. It may be inconsiderate of a person's values, goals, and definition of quality of life. It can cause physical and psychological harm. It can increase financial burdens through hospital costs, long-term care costs, and costs to caregivers associated with lost wages, out-of-pocket expenses that are not covered by Medicare or Medicaid or insurance, and additional stress and anxiety. And it can create a sense of false hope when full disclosure regarding the CPS process is not provided. This impacts a patient and their family's ability to make decisions for the present and the future. Informed consent honors all of these ethical principles. Even when somebody has been determined unable to make their own medical decision, informed consent must be provided by their legally designated caregiver. In person or by proxy, people have the right to self-determination, to make decisions regarding what happens to their body. In view of all of this information, my proposal is that hospitals reverse their current default rule regarding CPR, that patients are not resuscitated unless they have provided informed consent. So why would I make a proposal that is probably controversial, that conflicts with hospital culture and community expectations. This change will align CPR with other invasive hospital procedures that require informed consent. It will provide patients and families with information not typically available under the current rule, allowing them to make better informed decisions. And it will, uh, it will enable patients and families to look at all the care options available to them and have discussions regarding important end-of-life issues. The primary goal of cardiopulmonary resuscitation is to prevent premature death. It is not to prolong inevitable death. Is this proposal controversial and provocative? It is. Does it challenge the status quo? I hope it does. We are in desperate need of a cultural shift regarding the way we consider and communicate about the end of life. Sometimes, cultural change requires a disruptor. This idea may be the disruptor to increase our sense of urgency, to have conversations about important end-of-life issues with those we care for and those we care about. Thank you.